It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here. Lots of security news. More about the NSA. And then he's going to talk about some of the uh, some of the things he remembers. He learned way back when when he was writing Spinrite. It are still true today. A look at Intel memory management and more next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 410, recorded June 26, 2013. Interesting Intel history. Security Now is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the Internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. For 20% off your new account, go to ProXPN.com slash twit and use the code SN20. It's time for Security Now, the show that protects you, your loved ones, your privacy, your security. Man, there wasn't, there couldn't be a better time. <laughs> we did, we thought when we started doing this show seven years ago that we'd run out of topics. Yep, and maybe take about twenty minutes a day, or you know, a week, twenty minutes a week, just sort of a quick little touch base. What happened? I have a new prediction. Steve Gibson, our host and explainer in chief. I have a new prediction. <laughs> <laughs> this show's going to get longer, and there's more stuff. In the next 10 years, privacy and security are going to be the topic of the day. That's, That's just funny my thought. Because Elaine quotes for her transcription cost based on the length of oh, the podcast. Getting longer. <laughs> so, well, I've tripled my budget for, oh, geez. for, oh, man. for, for the transcripts that we, we created. We'll go in with podcast. you. Contact yeah. Lisa. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll split yeah. the cost. Steve is here. He is the man at GRC.com, the creator of Spinrite, and that's going to be germane, and you'll find out why in a moment. It's the world's finest hard drive recovery and maintenance utility. He's also a great benefactor to all humankind with the free stuff he puts <gasps> up at GRC.com. Well, all computing humankind, like Shields yeah, a subset. A subset. The worthwhile subset. Password haystacks and more. Um, and uh, what are we going to do today steve well okay so our yeah um our listeners know because i talked about it briefly the last couple of weeks that i'm back at work on Spinrite, and frankly i was a little nervous about mentioning it i've actually been working on it for about two months you don't want deadlines well i don't i don't work on with deadlines yeah. but i was worried that it would stop its sales i mean oh. that if People knew there was a new one coming. They'd say, oh, I might as well wait for that. Cool. But, but the fact is, sales has not been hurt by my talking about it. Mm. And um, and it is the case that all I've made the promise to all existing Spinrite 6 owners that what I do next will be free. That everyone who has it will be able to update themselves to this next one I'm working on. Isn't that generous? Well, it just, I mean, it's been nine years and people are saying, oh, we want to give you more money. Has it really been I nine years since the last? Yeah. I finished, oh, I, it was 04 that I, that Spinrite 6 launched and not a bite has changed in nine years. On the other hand, not a bite has changed in nine <laughs> right. years. Right. It didn't need to be. So, well, it didn't need to be, but over time there have been some things that, have come along. For example, now drives often have the so-called advanced format with 4K sectors rather than to traditional 512 byte sectors. Um, and so that can interact. I mean, it, the, the drives are like upward compatible. Spinrite, frankly, has been rather amazingly upward compatible such that it's nine years old and still is recovering data for people without any problems. But there are a bunch of things that I can make better. And you know, I got all these other things done, and it's like, okay, it, Spinrite was calling. So 
what I'm going to talk about today, I think everyone is going to find interesting. Um, it's one of our, we haven't done this for actually for years, one of our fundamental technology propeller head episodes. Anybody who pays attention, I don't know if you could, you know, I mean, you have to be listening to this in order to understand it, but none of this is difficult. Um, and essentially, what I'm going to explain is how what seems to be a mistake and oversight in the early design of the evolution of the Intel processor from the 8088 that we first got in the IBM PC to the 286 to the 386, right back in that region, a something was discovered. And it turns out I need it today for Spinrite, for the next, for, for the evolution of Spinrite. And I, I had sort of a hazy understanding of it a week ago. Now I'm an expert. I know exactly what happened. I know how it happened and why it happened and what it does. And, and so we're, we're, we're going to go back in time and look, and, you know, the old timers among us uh, will, uh, will be sort of familiar with all this, but maybe not have ever focused on it as much as, as I have had to recently. Um, and I, I think everyone's going to find it interesting. Even young kids. It's like, well, you mean there actually was a history before the internet? Yes, <laughs> there was. There was. We and, had and, computers. And you and I remember the, it. I mean, we were there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were so writing that's our for topic. World at the we time. We do have a bunch of interesting stuff my i mean like like at the top of the show as usual we um my very favorite bit of nsa prism humor uh was I, i've embellished on the concept which i got from from twitter matt uh sarabian i think is how he would pronounce his name um it, so it's short being a tweet uh although i did enhance it so it is okay nsa How's this for a compromise? You add packet level virus detection and removal to your splitter boxes and we'll call it even. Yeah, at least we so, get something for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, say, hey, you you go, you add internet wide antivirus and just like, yeah, okay, then you know, well, you know, go ahead. Did you anyway. see that uh Oh yes, <laughs> I even know what you're gonna say. Uh, do you really? <laughs> I bet I do. So if you use encryption or Tor, yes, it's in the notes here, Leo. <laughs> okay, good, I know right. you are presumed guilty. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's, oh, it's, we're uh, definitely capturing that traffic. I don't care where yeah, you are. You know, if you didn't, uh, 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 yeah. Well, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. All but, right. All right. <laughs> so save that. So, but yes, I did see it, and I was just like, oh my goodness, so, unbelievable. Since we talked last, another another drop of news from our our friend, uh, or some people don't like him, but other people think he's a hero. Blah blah blah. He's certainly controversial. Our controversial entity, Edward the leaker. Snow the AP the style le guide says you're supposed to call him a leaker. Okay, I think that you works. Because you call him a whistleblower, that means you like what he did. If you call him a traitor, that means well, you now don't. Now we have espionage, of course. Now he's, I don't know, if is there a, are you a something he's if a you are guilty of it? It's a spy. Okay, yeah, so he's, he's being accused under the 1917 Espionage Act. And it's ironic that they're, the U.S. is accusing him on sp of spying for revealing that the U.S. is spying on us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, and again, it's that fantastic Stephen Colbert tweet. Uh, uh, why are you upset about uh, the, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember it exactly, but it was like, why are you getting upset about what the NSA is doing with their secret spying program that they're hiding from everyone? <laughs> so it's like, okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so what then the news was, and many people uh, tweeted this to make sure that I was aware of it, that... It turns out the UK is engaged in as large, if maybe not even larger, a internet-wide spying operation. And this time we know that they are tapping all of the fiber optic cables coming in and out. So, so this was the first time we've 
We've seen contemporary, I don't know if this is a confirmation of my theory, but many people have felt it was that, you know, because in the news that we got that was most recently released, it was, okay, you, the UK is tapping everything. Oh, and they are, of course, cooperatively sharing with the U.S. Which of so, means it's, I'm sure, reciprocal. It's not like the U.S. would say, yeah. please give us everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even though we've probably already seen it. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. a second copy. Oh, goodness. And so, yes. And so here in my notes, I said, additional clarifications to Congress. This came out during during the re the hearings that have been, that, that have resulted from Edwards leaking. And that is the NSA's Re guidelines and regulations state that, quote, encrypted communications, just the fact that they are encrypted, is in and of itself suspicious due to what it might contain and is therefore subject to lawful capture and storage. So if you're encrypting it, that's suspicious in and of itself. So we can we can save it. So now we do know where all of those zettabytes are, are going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if uh, you use Tor, same thing. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. So we just had yesterday a new release of Firefox. The countdown to 23 is what I call this because <laughs> 23, <laughs> 23 is when third-party cookies get blocked by default. And that's still happening. My, Mozilla is still rattling their sabers, and it's still causing upset and concern on the 19th of this month. The Washington Post, uh, in the business technology section, uh, said Firefox, but the headline was Firefox browser to move ahead with do not track. And actually, that was a little bit of a misprint or misstatement because what they were actually talking about was third-party cookie blocking. So that's slated for 23. It was, you know, as, as we know, it was pushed back until uh, August. And so that's oh. that when we see it's, 23. So you're talking about third-party cookies, not do not yes. track. Oh, okay. Yeah, do not track is already there. So third-party cookies are uh, 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 blocked on Safari by default. Correct. Uh, what does Chrome do? Chrome, I think, doesn't, because uh -uh. Google's Chrome's an not advertising company, so they, the they're never going to... Yeah, precisely. It'll be really interesting to me if Chrome is, I mean, if, if as you said, Safari has always been a third-party cookie blocker. Mozilla and Firefox, which is super popular, of course, will, will join that camp. Uh, Microsoft always talks about it and then never does it. They've, they've, several of the betas have had that on and then they always backpedal because of pressure from the advertising industry. Um, so that will leave those two, essentially. Well, and Opera, although Opera doesn't have a large market share. So of the two biggies, IE and Chrome, we'll, we'll see what happens. My sense is this is a battle the advertising industry is losing because they're not, essentially, if you look at the, at, at the dialogue going on, they are refusing to budge. They are, they're unwilling to honor do not track. And so... Mozilla is saying, fine, we're just going to block third-party cookies. If you, know, if you guys won't come to the table and negotiate in good faith, and the advertising industry is saying, you can't understand, we have to track people. And, but, you know, nope, so they're not tracking Safari users, and they're soon not going to be tracking Firefox Well, users. there may so, be an unfortunate, I'd... unattended consequence, because they've said now, well, we're just going to go to fingerprinting, which we've talked about before, this ability. Yep. They, they don't need cookies, really. No. And uh, and the fingerprinting you can't you can't really stop. Uh, you oh have, yeah, oh well, yeah. You have to work it in incognito mode or something, right? No, yeah, we can. No, we'll talk about that. Oh, good. Oh, all right. Yeah, we can block that too. I just my my take is nothing will happen. This is much to do about nothing. Nothing will happen. All advertising will still work. Revenue will still flow. The whole ecosystem. It does actually not depend upon this. Well. Also, because in all likelihood, most people will leave it on if it's on by, off by default. No, no, that's the point. It's going right. on by default. Right. So, but, so but right now, Internet Explorer uh, and uh, Chrome, Chrome occupy yes. what percentage of the uh, total browsing? Yeah, you're right. There, Chrome is seventy percent. Chrome is really making inroads. Yeah. So, and I don't think IE has ever dropped below fifty because it's just the default browser. And, and you know. if they start using fingerprinting, they're not going to announce it. No. 
Fingerprinting, we should mention, is the ability to figure out who you are, not based on any cookie, but just things like browser uh, resolution. And just uh, if you p put enough factors together, everybody's unique. Well, it's yes. Uh, we, we've talked about we've talked about this in various contexts. It is the metadata that your browser oh, sends. Oh, that, that old word metadata. The blog. <laughs> that old black <laughs> magic got me in its spell. It's all of the headers See, because the, in, 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 in the headers, for example, are things like all of the different versions of, of add-ons that you've got. Right. Like, the, you know, Java adds itself to the headers and all these different, all the different packages have many digit version numbers. And so you add them all. It, when you t look, look at them as an aggregate, it ends up being that, it, it, and it was uh, Panopticlick was the right, site right, right, right. that deals with this. Um, it turns out you can still get a, a, a pretty good uh, lock on a person. But all we have to do is rearrange the headers and scramble the data a bit and change it. So it would be very easy to for people to do, for example, browser add-ons, which, which completely blow fingerprinting. Fingerprinting is only useful at the moment because all that data, all that data, is relatively static. But none of it needs to be kept static. Right. So, anyway, um, we've just got yesterday Firefox version 22. Um, it's fixed 14 vulnerabilities, and that's why I was saying I, I call this the countdown or the or the count up to 23. We're one version away from third-party cookies being blocked by default in Firefox, uh, which is still my go-to browser. Chrome has just gotten so bloated, Leo. I launch it and I watch my memory just collapse. So I'm hoping at some point that Google will come back to that. And we'll remember, you know, we talked about it here, how much focus the Mozilla folks put on memory. They got to a point where they said, okay, we've just got to stop and fix our memory consumption problem. They had leaks and they had memory that was just, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of natural in, in the development cycle to be to be adding features and under deadline and you're under the gun and you're writing code and it works and then you just send it. Well, it all takes up space. And so the, the notion of, of examining memory consumption is very similar to examining security problems. That is, authors who are just writing code to make them make it work aren't always thinking about security they're not always thinking about memory consumption because they're just like well okay we you know i need this much memory and so they grab it or if they're not sure how much they grab more than they need because if you grab less than you need then you're in trouble so so it's a so it's a sort of a different phase of in the same way that you audit an app for security you can audit it for memory consumption and we'll remember that it was about a year ago that firefox really got serious about memory problems because it was out of control and frankly that's where chrome is now i don't launch chrome unless i really have to because it's just it's just ridiculous opera is like a, a fraction of the 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 consumption and you know they all sort of work in the same way um so with version 22 this released yesterday of firefox we got for the first time in firefox a set of new standards which chrome already has called web rtc and i've not yet done a deep dive into it so i'll just quote from TechCrunch that that explained it well TechCrunch said web rtc allows developers to create web pages with built-in video and audio calls as well as file sharing without the need for any plugins or third-party software. Yeah, this is uh, something Google's been pushing, and uh, we yes. want to use because you know we use Skype right now. But yes, we are very yeah. interested in having a WebRTC implementation that would just mean you, so, you, we could give you a private website. You'd go to it, and you'd be on. So think about this. I mean, this is huge. This means that that audio, video, and file interaction would be. It will be, it is now in Chrome, it will be in Firefox, natively available so that just JavaScript using new APIs to access the WebRTC allows these apps to run in the browser. 
So, I mean, he, this is a big step forward towards, you know, the browser is everything model. Um, and so c continuing what, te what TechCrunch said, they said, until now, only Google's Chrome supported uh, the budding standard in its mainstream browser releases. Now that Firefox with release 22 also supports it in its stable branch, we will likely see a large number of startups and established companies examine this technology far closer. Microsoft so far remains the only major vendor who has decided to go ahead with a different, oh my God, with a different standard for the same functionality. But I wouldn't be surprised if Internet Explorer 2 would support WebRTC out of the box in the near future. So that's cool. And then the technology that is really interesting, um, not, uh, not, and it's not only because it has a SEM in its name, Leo, just, uh, yes, it is. They, they're, they're, call, they're calling it ASM.js. You know, ASM um, we've talked about this before, and I, I, it's really interesting. It is a... The, the the guys working on JavaScript speed realized that a lot of time was being spent in JavaScript on things, on features in JavaScript that eh, you could live without. You know, there's like, there's, because JavaScript is sort of an automatic language that it, the way it, it creates um, and destroys variables, it, there's there's the need to do garbage collection if it realizes that things you've referenced are no longer useful or no longer being referenced and not going to be then it says oh I can free up this memory well that's that there there's like an overhead associated with being that smart which which adds a layer of complexity to the entire language so what what they realized was you know if we defined a, a, if carefully defined a subset just of JavaScript, still JavaScript, but like only allowed certain features and, and explicitly disallowed a bunch of these fancy ones, we could make this much faster. Yeah. And so that's what assem.js is. It is a subset of JavaScript that screams. And there's, for example, a compiler called mscripten, which can compile C and C++ code into this subset of JavaScript. And it is, and is, and compared to native performance, it's a, it's, it's running as fast as only half as fast, which is a bad way of saying it. It's, <laughs> it's, I don't, I don't, it's, it's half you, as you fast. You only have a 50% hit. Yes, which is amazing because, I mean, native code is screaming on today's processors. Right, right. And so now we're talking about completely browser. I mean, we're talking about a web page being able to execute code that is only half as fast, which is, which, I mean, which is still amazingly fast. And, in fact, Mozilla has a page... Shoot, I can't remember the name of it now. I'm going through a presentation about it, and I guess the, the point being is that hand-optimized, there's so many good optimizations that people don't use when they hand, when they write in JavaScript. And so hand-optimized right. code is not going to be as good unless you really pay attention to it. Right, right. and so, and so, and so but, 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 but the point is that by, by formally denying access to the whole JavaScript right. blank... a subset. Yeah. Yes. By formally denying access to all of the things that are expensive and slow, you end up with a subset fully useful, which is extensive enough that you can write a compiler to compile standard C and C++ into a sem.js, and it runs like a bat out of hell. <laughs> so it's, that's how I should have said it. it runs like a bat, bat out, of out of hell. hell. Bad out of hell, and I love it that uh, it's C. I mean, I you know, I mean, that's I feel yeah. very comfortable with that. JavaScript always looked a lot like C, but yeah, uh, well, it's sort of the, you know we we've we've come up with sort of this agreed upon pseudo code. You know, if you like, if you look at articles in Wikipedia or in in computer textbooks, they sort of use you know code that anybody can read because it's you know it's sort of like basic, it's sort of like right. C, it's sort of like Pascal, it's just sort of this 
goop that's sort of like, oh, it looks generic. And that's sort of what JavaScript looks like. Also, you know, just, just running it know. through something like this also, as they point out, is uh, because it's a, got formal type checking, you're going to avoid a lot of common JavaScript bugs. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is good. Yeah. So huh. it's really It's not nice. the first it's time just... somebody's done something like this. It's quite a few of these. There, uh, yes, there have been many different types of like, like there's JIT just in time compilers and 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 different well, Google, approaches. Google has a, a GWT, which uh, is used in a lot of uh, Android stuff. GWT, the Google Toolkit. Um, yeah, there's Coffee. There's well, there's a lot of stuff. Coffee Script. Huh. Cool. So you think this will be widely adopted? Okay. Uh, well, it needs to go multi-browser. You so just, you just at like this it because it's ASM. <laughs> <laughs> if only somebody would write an assembly language JavaScript compiler. That's what well, we need. And, and Google does have their own native code project um, that they're working on. So, you know, we're seeing everyone wanting to move toward toward more performance and to uh, to give browsers enough speed that that we can implement the, you know full applications in the browser and and continue to add more power so this is just another step in that direction i'm i'm glad to see the mozilla folks doing it i'm glad for what google's doing it ultimately we'll come up with a standard you know and, and then maybe microsoft will support it mm -hmm. we we can hope mm -hmm. um bruce schneier uh is actually where i picked up on an article in the New York Times that had one of the most interesting quotes from the EFF about all of this I have seen. But I'll hold that for a minute because what what Bruce had to say um, and, and the, the, the blog, his blog post that caught my eye was new details on Skype eavesdropping. And you probably ran across this too in the last week, this Project Chess, Leo? Yeah. Okay, so the New York Times article, on uh, uh, this is Bruce writing, this article on the cozy relationship between the commercial personal data industry and the intelligence industry has new information on the security of Skype. So now switching to the New York Times article, quoting from that, Skype, the internet-based calling service, began its own secret program, Project Chess, to explore the legal and technical issues in making Skype calls readily available to intelligence agencies and law enforcement officials. According this is to way pre-Microsoft. This, yes. uh, this is under years, eBay. Years, yes, yes. According to people briefed on the program who asked not to be named to avoid trouble with the intelligence agencies. Project Chess which has never been previously disclosed, was small, limited to fewer than a dozen people inside Skype, and was developed as the company had sometimes contentious talks with the government over legal issues, said one of the people briefed on the project. The project began about five years ago, before most of the company was sold by its parent eBay to outside investors in 2009. Microsoft acquired Skype in an $8.5 billion deal that was completed in October of 2011. A Skype executive denied last year in a blog post that recent changes in the way Skype operated were made at the behest of Microsoft to make snooping easier for law enforcement. It appears, however, that Skype figured out how to cooperate with the intelligence community before Microsoft took over the company, according to documents leaked by none other than Edward J. Snowden, a former contractor for the NSA, one of the documents about the prison program made public by Mr. Snowden, says Skype joined PRISM on February 6, 2011, so about six months prior to Microsoft's closing their acquisition deal. So back to Bruce Snyder, who, who continues his blog, saying, reread that Skype denial from last, from last July. Knowing that at the time, the company knew 
that they were giving the NSA access to customer communications. Notice how it is precisely worded to be technically accurate, yet leave the reader with the wrong conclusion. And this is Bruce speaking, saying, this is where we are with all the tech companies right now. We can't trust their denials, just as we can't trust the NSA or the FBI when it denies programs, capabilities, or practices. Back in January, we wondered whom Skype lets spy on their users. Now we know. So he points out, also, he says, Bruce says, you can't trust the NSA and you can't trust these companies. Their denials right. are meaningless. So we just don't know what's going on. We just, yeah, we don't know. In that article, as I mentioned before, was a quote from uh, Dan Auerbach, who is a technology analyst with the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I just, and I thought this was the best thing I've read. He said, we reached a tipping point where the value of having user data rose beyond the cost of storing it. Now we have an incentive to keep it forever. And I think that's just exactly it. We know what's happened to the cost of storage in the last few years. It's just, it's ridiculous how large drives have become and how inexpensive per byte storage has become. At some point, the, the cost to store drops under the, 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 the cost to store drops so low that the value, the perceived value of keeping everything outweighs it. And as he says, we've crossed that tipping point. Oh, yeah. Oh, Thus, yeah. five zettabytes <laughs> in Utah, five billion terabytes. I, I paid uh, 250 bucks for this thing called a Momoto. It's a camera that records an image every 30 seconds. You wear it around your neck or on your <laughs> lapel. <laughs> And then it uploads. It does. Uh, it does a lot of parsing of this data. Puts together life, stuff. Look, it has life logging. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it has GPS in it. Uh, uploads it to their server. Stores it. Uh, you know, I mean, I think this is a. Good <laughs> and they say it's great uh, for uh, later when you get Alzheimer's because you can just go. <laughs> you can go back and look. I never went there. Oh, yes, you did, Grandpa. <laughs> and the name recognition, uh, you know, there's name recognition, and Picasa does it, Facebook does it. So, you know, you just kind of apply some of these engines to it. Pretty soon, you know, you got a whole record of everything you ever did. And so does the NSA, because they're happy you're I doing it. I couldn't care video. less if they do. I, you know, I'm go just, ahead, fine. If I you're know. really that, that's why, well, the trick is to overload them. So you have so much, you know, on me. You got, you know, what are you going to do? I know they're, I, I'm using PGP. I'm dead already. Really? We, ought to, we ought to just have, create an app that just sends out pseudo-random noise because that looks like encryption. And then they're going to record it all. But that's the, you know. <laughs> exactly. And I can just, yeah. <sighs> I'm, if, just if, there were out of our ports. if there were somewhere one could go. I would consider going there. But I don't know. There's nowhere if, you know. Everybody's well, the only thing, the only thing that I think is kind of cool is when we have an app, um, when we have like an, an instant messaging app, where we absolutely know that it is secure. Like like the, the one um, I talked about last week, Threema, where you actually to get the highest level of security, you have to face your phones. They have to face each other, and they each look at the others private key i mean at, 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 at the others like like you know uh, uh q uh what is it qrc i can't think of the name what uh q you know the little square barcode q something oh, uh, qr code yeah qr code yeah, yeah qr code yeah um and and that you have they have to be physical physically in in proximity then they can exchange directly the, their their public key that matches their private key, and then you get three green dots. And from forever on after that, you know that when you send a text to through the Threema system to a recipient, I like this. 
I do too. And it's like you have to meet I, him in meat space at some point, right? Yes, for exactly. This to make sense, but, it, yeah, but you, that's you have. Yeah. Yes, you have a. There's three levels of security. You can use their distribution server, but then you only get two dots, and I think it's orange, and one dot is red, and it's only when you when you have, as you said, meat space, uh, M E A T, that you that you have proven you've been in proximity to the other device. Now that now you have absolute authentication. I love this. And, and afterwards, I just I like the idea. I just you know. I guess it's a little thumb of the nose of, you know, I'm sending this and absolutely nobody else on the planet right. is can possibly intercept it and read it. I don't need that. No, I don't need it because, I'm you know, I'm talking to Jenny about when we're going to meet for dinner. But it's just like. Well, that's yeah. my plan. I just want to swamp them. I think if all of us honest folks just swamp them. You know, I mean, uh, IBM estimated that there's it's 55 what? It'd be good for the Utah real estate market, Leo. <laughs> I think we can swim. I know zettabytes are a lot, but um, already there's a lot. You know, what was uh, IBM had a big data, total amount of g data generated every day. What was it? it was um, Well, th this whole move to going digital, it's, I mean, uh, it's, I, I, oh, it's I, we've huge. all seen the quotes. It's like the total amount of data that exists, that is created every week is like more than that ever existed in the history of man or something like that. I mean, it's just, it's gone exponential already. So according to IBM, and this is on their big data <laughs> page, uh, every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone. <laughs> so I think we can, you know, I don't know how many, quint how many, not 2.5 quintillion bytes, how many, how many zeta? How much? How long before we fill up a zettabyte? Somebody do the math. <laughs> and all we have to do, probably all we have to do, is you know double or triple that, and um, there'll be so much yeah. noise. Let them try to find the needle in the haystack. Yep. That's why I'm going to record th every 30 seconds a high res picture of what I'm up to. <laughs> and send it up. And send it up to the cloud. Send Go ahead, enjoy off. NSA. Send it off. It's all yours, baby. Now, the other little bit of interesting Edward Snowden news to arrive was picked up by the Daily Beast, who interviewed uh, Glenn Greenwald, who's our friend at The Guardian, who's been sort of the main contact person for Snowden. Poor Glenn and, Greenwald is getting trashed. I know. and it's, He's a it's, journalist, folks, you know? Yes. This, this is what we're Boy, supposed I was to do. Disappointed First Amendment. That, David I was Gregory, what a dick. Yes. I was just going to say, yeah. David Gregory's question on Sunday was just, it was ridiculous. Um, although, you know, he said, to the extent that is the way he started yeah. it. And it's, it's like, like saying, well, no offense, but are you a spy for the bad yeah. guys? No offense. It, 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 was, it was really, really, really He, he basically case. implied that in his journalist, that Glenn wasn't a journalist or that in his journalistic endeavor. He was aiding and abetting. He was aiding and abetting. And, yes. I, you know, this is called the First Amendment. This is called, uh, you know, I just, it's shocking. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I'm telling you, if there was somewhere I could move, I would, but I don't, it's, there's nowhere to go. <sighs> We're in the best place. Yeah, we are. So. At least we can um, talk about it freely still. Nobody's pounding what, on our door. No stormtroopers. What can uh, and that's why I love the country. I yeah. mean I I I do. And it's not these over are yet. Good, Let's fight for these, it. These are and of course we know that the Supreme Court did the right thing, I yeah. think. Day, they so. did one bad thing last week or Monday and one yep. good thing today. So Yeah. Um anyway. Fifty fifty. <laughs> uh <laughs> This is not a surprise, but this was interesting to have it made more explicit. And this is Eli Lake writing for the Daily Beast, who interviewed Glenn Greenwald. Eli wrote, as the U.S. government presses Moscow to extradite former National Security Agency contractor Edward Snowden, America's most wanted leaker, has a plan B. The former NSA systems administrator has already given encoded files containing an archive of the secrets he lifted from his old employer to several people. If anything happens to Snowden, the files will unlock. Glenn Greenwald, the Guardian journalist who Snowden first contacted in February, told the Daily Beast on Tuesday, which is yesterday from this podcast's recording date, that Snowden, quote, has taken extreme precautions to make sure many different people around the world 
have these archives to ensure the stories will inevitably be published. Greenwald added that the people in possession of these files, quote, cannot access them yet because they are highly encrypted and they do not have the passwords. But Greenwald said, if anything happens at all to Edward Snowden, he told me he has arranged for them to get access to the full archives. The fact, and now, now back to Eli, the fact that Snowden has made digital copies of the documents he accessed while working at the NSA poses a new challenge to the U.S. intelligence community that has scrambled in recent days to recover them and, and assess the full damage of the breach. Even if U.S. authorities catch up with Snowden and the four classified laptops the Guardian reported he brought with him to Hong Kong, the secrets Snowden hopes to expose will still likely be published. A former U.S. counterintelligence officer following the Snowden saga closely said his contacts inside the U.S. intelligence community think, quote, Snowden has been planning this for years and has stashed the files all over the Internet. This source added, at this point, there is very little anyone can do about this. The arrangement to trust encrypted archives of his files with others also sheds light on a cryptic statement Snowden made on June 12 during a live chat with The Guardian. In the online session, he said, quote, all I can, uh, he, Snowden, said, all I can say right now is the U.S. government is not going to be able to cover this up by jailing or murdering me. Truth is coming, and it cannot be stopped. Last week, NSA Director Keith Alexander told the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence that Snowden was able to access files inside the NSA by fabricating digital keys that gave him access to areas he was not allowed to visit wow. as a, I know, as a low-level contractor and systems administrator. One of those areas included a site he visited during his training that Alexander later told reporters contained one of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the FISA court orders, published by The Guardian and The Washington Post earlier this month. So clearly, our intelligence agencies are really looking closely at what's come out that they're aware that Snowden has, and then backtracking all of their logs of his access to figure out what more he may have. But anyway, so what's interesting is that there is a dead man switch. You know, he's, he's created that. And it, it's funny, Leo, because there's so many times now in like plots in movies and on TV where it's like, well, okay, why did you, you know, send, put this all in an envelope and send it to your attorney or send it to your mother or right. do something, you know. Well, to be fair, it, a lot of movies, they do that also. I mean, the, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're right. It's been a, it's been a, it's a plot device. Yeah. And, but it, it, I don't put it, I mean, it, it's funny because we've seen criticism of, of Edward a lot in the last couple of weeks, but I watched the video a couple times of him being interviewed and it seems very clear to me that this guy is no dummy and that he did all of this on his own schedule. Everything has been on his own schedule. You know, and even his move to Hong Kong that was roundly criticized by all the talking heads that yeah, wanted to be critical. Paid off. That all, that all worked exactly yeah. according to plan also. You know, and now he's got Julian Assange and his team, you know, working with him and and he's, you know, he's now moved to Russia and and uh, asylum in Ecuador is apparently in the works. So anyway, we'll see how this plays out one way or the other. Uh, you know, we'll certainly talk about it from a news angle. But given that this was all on his schedule, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if, you know, this is a exactly true, that somehow something needs to, you know, I mean, we've even talked about, uh, uh, what was it, um, Daniel Suarez's, you know, network aware technology. I mean, it would be easy for bots somewhere to be monitoring news and, you know, reading news stories and, and act 
at that level. Or just, you know, he has to do something on the Internet, send email to somewhere, and it bounces around, or who knows what, every so often in order to keep something alive. Or maybe it's just an agreement with people who know that they have this information, you know, if it appears that, you know, I disappear, uh, you know, press this button or do this or send this to somewhere, you know, didn't, whatever. Didn't this same article say that Greenwald's uh, computer was stolen after he mentioned on Skype uh, that he had data on this computer? Ooh, I hadn't. hadn't yeah, had. he's in uh, he's mm. in Rio. I mean, this whole thing is, uh, wow. you know, if, if, as some say, Snowden is making it all up, it sure is annoying somebody uh, in D.C. A yeah. lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Yeah, well, and in fact, in, in that first video he made, he said, yeah, we, you know, we have the CIA field office just down the block from here. He says, I imagine they're pretty busy right around now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Yeah, they are. So, anyway, uh, uh, enough on that. Uh, we there was a bunch of uh, I, I sent something out on Twitter that that I tweeted. Uh, I, I tweeted to the NSA's question: If you have nothing to hide, why is your communic uh, to the NSA's question asking us? If you have nothing to hide, why is your communications encrypted? I ask in turn: How would you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I got back a bunch of fun tweets, but the best one of all uh, came from Nathan Long uh, tweeting as Sleepless Geek. And he said, one might say, I have nothing to hide from people I trust. Oh, there you and go. And I thought that was exactly that's right. That's a good way to put it. That's, that's, exactly, it. that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. It's not that I have anything to hide. I have nothing to hide from people I trust. All right. But we just can't trust the government to uh, not misuse that information. Well, it uh, if for me, it's you know the the gloves are off when the director of national intelligence lies. flatly lies to Congress. Lies. That's it. Yeah. It's like he, you know, that's sorry, that's you you can't that our system depends upon oversight mm -hmm. and and it's uh, it was uh, it was in the law. It was it was built in, and if you short circuit it then, sorry, you don't get anything anymore. Yep. Um, a couple TV notes. Monday night, we had the premiere of the Stephen King novel-based TV series, Under the Dome. Oh. Did it you read was, that? Did you like it? Well, no. Uh, however, I Thorat heard, liked it. He didn't like the end, he said, but he liked the book. I heard that, actually. Someone... Yeah. I, I, I tweeted earlier that, uh, that the... That they, the first episode, the premiere episode was Monday. It is being repeated. I didn't know what night, but probably like this weekend. Yeah, they're, they're, they will be it's repeated. on demand. What do you need to... Okay. So for all of our <laughs> listeners, for what it's worth, you know... All, Get Hulu this is Plus. Not, Watch it on This Hulu is not Plus. giving anything away because you know this from, you know, even the name and, and, and the previews. But a small town suddenly gets instantly cut off by a force field. Which just appears out of nowhere, and it's the story of that, and 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 based on a Stephen King novel. Now I downloaded it because I thought, okay, I can't I can't wait for like this to be you know doled out to me a week at a time. So I I thought I'm just going to read the book. Oh my lord, is it big? I mean, even the table of contents. No, you know, I'm on, even the table kind of scrolls I'm on, on and on and I'm on, on a break like, from Stephen King. I finished the stand, and now I need a breather for a year or two, and then I'll <laughs> I'll look it under the dome. So he writes a lot of I, words. Boy, so uh, I, the 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 response I got that I saw before I shut down my Twitter client for the podcast was that that the people in the series and yeah, both inside and I got no I get no the people in the book both inside and outside the dome, don't behave in a realistic manner. And if that's true, that would really annoy me because I hate when writers do that, when writers make their characters do things that are, like, dumb. It's like, I, you know... Or I think that's like, a, a fair knock on a lot of King's stuff. Oh, it, yeah. yeah. Have you Andy, read any of his other books? I've never been a Stephen King reader because I've just I've got so much sci-fi going on. He's but, a great writer. and I, I, think, like, his, I like the, the movies that have been made yeah, from his. He's a very good writer. But I think you could that 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 is a fair 
complaint to make about almost everything. It, it's so plot driven that the the characters have to work in support of the plot. Yeah, and that doesn't always. You know, the stand had a number of characters that just were wooden because they were they were <laughs> forwarding the plot. They weren't M O O N. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> you did read the stand. Oh, I saw it. Oh, yeah. oh it was a, it was a show. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good example, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, um, also, Falling Skies. I mentioned it before. I wanted to reiterate. Wow, season three is really. I mean, it's 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 all it's. I, I I'd be hard pressed to say whether it's worth putting up with the first season and most in the first half of the second season. The, the second season began to get really good. They're really on to something now. I, I it is. I think the best of the, you know, low budget sci-fi tv series that are that are on right now is falling skies i think it's great it's low budget and, well yeah i mean you know they're all trying to not spend as much money as they you know yeah. i mean to, to to minimize the cost and so special effects are like oh, okay i mean they're they're fine but but you know they're character driven um yeah you know sci-fi settings i, I, I like character driven i don't mind character driven yeah and and it's it's gotten it's really gotten better um, and I got two tweets, I will just say, because in response to my recommending The Killing, the series on AMC, which Yo, I talked ooh, about last week. I can't watch that. Uh, <laughs> oh, and, um, and one, uh, uh, Abdullah Hamad in the UAE, he tweeted, thanks for recommending the TV series The Killing. The act, he said, the acting is beyond excellent. Is. excellent. They all deserve an Oscar. And that's what it is, Leo. I just, I just, I'm, I, I want to like watch it again, just to watch the acting again. It is, it is superb. And then uh, someone, M. D. Seuss, tweeted. He said, "Thanks, I think, for the recommendation on the killing. I can't stop watching it. It is great." So Good. he was, he's as sucked in as I was, yeah. which is, which is cool. We uh, do you want to do a spin right uh, testimonial? Well, I know in some ways this whole so. show is about spin right. So precisely, yeah. So we'll do that in a second. We'll talk about uh, what you've learned, some intel history, useful and interesting that but, I needed. Something that I needed from the, the twenty years past. Wow. Yeah. Little. Uh, let's talk about memory segmentation <laughs> in just a moment. But uh, first, we'd, let's talk about protecting your privacy online with Pro XPN. ProXPN is a provider of uh, open VPN solutions uh, that are, they have free, that will protect your privacy, that will protect your content, encryption, strong encryption, through which all of your content goes. It's a great idea. We've talked about open VPN many times on this show. And uh, Steve has vetted ProXPN and, uh, and said, yep, they're, they're doing it right. They're implementing it uh, the right way uh, using uh, open VPN. We... Uh, uh, one of the things I would note that uh, it particularly now is of uh, interest is that they are uh, homed all over the world. So when your your traffic is encrypted in, in a tunnel to the v open uh, to the Pro XPN servers, but those servers then exit out into the public internet. That's how VPNs work. But they do it all over the world: Dallas, Seattle, London, Singapore, Los Angeles, New York City, and Amsterdam. So you get some, uh, you know, privacy and anonymity via that. It, it eliminates any kind of geographical restrictions for Internet content uh, because those servers are all over the world. You pick the country that makes sense. You can uh, forget about your ISP six strikes rule. Not going to be a problem. Your ISP cannot see what you're doing. And frankly, I think your ISP may be the biggest privacy violator. They, they aren't really watched by anybody. Uh, so take a look at Pro XPN. You can try it out. It works uh, also via PPTP on those devices that don't support OpenVPN. Usually uh, smartphones don't. Pro XPN is a global virtual private network that works with almost any internet connection. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. Any online application can work with Pro XPN because it's completely transparent to your web browser, to your email, to your file sharing to your instant messenger. Everything you do is on uh, is online, is hidden from prying, not prying eyes, and disguises your physical location, giving you unfettered access to any website or online service, no matter where you live or travel to. Try it free, but if you decide to get a, a premium account, they're normally 
$9.95 a month if you go month to month, or $74.95 if you buy a year's package, which is probably how you're going to want to do this. Now, use our offer code, though, SN20, and you'll get 20% off the lifetime of your account. That means when you buy that annual plan, it's less than 5 bucks a month. That's a good deal for, for true, well-implemented security. Pro XPN. They only keep their logs for two weeks, so your privacy is assured, even in cases of government subpoena. You can cancel within seven days, of course, for a full refund. Use SN20 as your offer code. Let them know you heard it on Security Now, proxpn.com. Steve Gibson, Leo Laporte, time to learn some history that is still of great value. So... Okay, a little um, to set the stage here. Um, this is all. Th this was driven by my my current R and D effort, essentially, for the next release of Spinrite, which I'm calling six point one. My my intent is not to rewrite Spinrite. Um, that would take a long time, and and it's really not necessary for, for what Spinrite is today. I do, because we've seen that Spinrite is able to recover SSD drives, it's like as far as we know, it's got a great track record of doing that. Um, that to me says, okay, it's not going away anytime soon. So I'm fully looking at a version 7, which will actually be a restart because I want to I want to add features that the current user interface just can't handle. And in fact, the, the, the whole architecture is not designed for, like going into the file system, having it be file system aware, allowing you to say, I want to pull this file off of the drive rather than just fix the whole drive. Um, or I want to pull all of my documents or I want to prioritize recovering files over recovering space, you know, and or I want to clone a dying drive to another drive. You know, these are things that that people have asked about. And it's like, well, yeah, but, you know, that's not what's been right. That's not the way it was originally designed. It was first designed when, you know, people only had one hard drive. It was like the most expensive component of their entire computing system because 10 megabytes was so expensive back then. And so you need, you know, the goal was just to fix that one huge investment you had. You know, people just weren't, you know, plugging hard drives in right and left. So, so in terms of my overarching plan, I'm fully intending to scrap everything I have right now, but not yet. So, so what 6.1 and there's probably going to be a point two and point three. The, the the focus is fix everything that I can, which in fact brings Spinrite current for the features that you know we've talked about that all these testimonials are based on and so forth. But just makes it better, but not different. Um, different will be version seven, and I'm going to have to go away for a long time. To, to create that. So we need an update to version six in the meantime. So, you know, I'm very methodical in the way I approach things. The, the first thing that I looked at was, was that Spinrite sometimes has a problem just with FreeDOS booting. And, and Spinrite, before Spinrite even gets a chance to run, some users have FreeDOS explode on them, and they never get a chance to run Spinrite. And the good news is that, you know, they'll call, they'll, they'll shoot an email. To, I mean, it doesn't happen often. Just, you know, it's a low, low, low level, but it's on, it's on, it's on, it's been on my radar for a while. Greg is always able to fix that just by helping them use MS-DOS rather than FreeDOS. We include FreeDOS because it's license-free. MS-DOS, you have to have Windows, but there are sites on the internet where you can download it. But even an XP that doesn't have DOS, you can have XP create a DOS bootable floppy, for example. And so there's MS-DOS is in Windows. It's still there. It's just, 
you know, you get to it when you say, I want to make a bootable floppy. So we can fix that. But what it, so, so the, so I started this project a couple months ago and I started looking at the FreeDOS kernel. Why is it blowing up? Well, it turns out that FreeDOS does something that MS-DOS doesn't, which is it tries to open a dummy file from every drive that it on all every partition of every drive it finds and it does that to populate some tables that are, that are used to manage the 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 fat systems on each of the drives partitions and it does that it turns out because some random norton utility blew up if you ran no, this norton utility from the dark ages on FreeDOS and asked it to access a drive that FreeDOS had not accessed before. And so they added this thing to FreeDOS where it went out and tried to open a file on every, on every partition of every drive. And in some cases of a particular type of disk damage, that will cause FreeDOS to die. So the first thing I did was create a custom kernel. So we have that now. Um, I added a new line to config sys. Uh, it just says skip init equals one. And so in the FreeDOS kernel that will be coming with the next version of SpinWrite, um, the, in the config sys, it'll say skip init equals one because SpinWrite doesn't need that. And actually it's dangerous, to as we've learned, to have FreeDOS do that. So, okay, first problem was solved. Second problem was the question of Mac compatibility. And I talked about how I rewrote the uh, the keyboard interface and now it's running on the Mac. It's running on my MacBook Air without any problem. There's more work to do there over on the booting side, but essentially, you know, that's resolved. So the next problem, and 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 this was substantial, was to, to get SpinWrite to operate all drives in what's called UDMA, ultra DMA mode. Many BIOSes do that, but not all do. And so if you're, and SpinWrite today has still been using the BIOS to perform its bulk data transfer. That is all of the reads and writes that it does it does you ask it just asks the bios for it the logic behind that is we just get complete compatibility because the bios always knows how to talk to the controllers that are on the motherboard but the bios doesn't always know how to do it fast and it really doesn't need to because in today's world the bios just gets the os booted and then the operating system uses its own drivers in order to, you know, to talk to the hardware and take over, which is why anyone who's ever set up a, a new operating system on a, on a, on a PC style machine knows that you, you know, the, the, the motherboard comes with drivers and you quickly install those in the OS so that it's able to talk to the hardware efficiently. So essentially SpinWrite needs to add to itself it needs to acquire an understanding of all of the latest hardware, the, the mass storage hardware that exists on, on motherboards. The other thing that it needs to do, oh, and I, I should mention, so I now have so-called PCI bus enumeration. That's all done and working. I wrote it in Windows. We the the gang in the new in the GR in the GRC.dev news group to pound it on it and tested it. And so now SpinWrite has the ability to understand the PCI bus and fully explore every controller on the PCI bus, finding all the mass storage controllers that are, are accessible in the machine. So even if the BIOS doesn't support something, it's still a PCI peripheral and SpinWrite will now find it. One of the problems that we've had with performance, because performance is is one of the areas I'm really focused on. You know, people have talked about how SpinWrite can spend weeks recovering, you know, like struggling on a really damaged hard drive. Typically, it takes, you know, maybe hours, um, but it can it can take weeks. 
clearly a huge aspect of convenience would be speed. We all, you know, none of us want the spin right to be slow. So one aspect is that SpinRight will incorporate its own low-level device drivers to talk directly to the hardware on the motherboard. And in fact, um, one, of the, one of the things that has happened with um, drive evolution and, and controllers, we had the original IDE interface, also known as the ATA interface. Um, then when PCI came along, there was something known as native PCI, which was sort of a, a bridge between the way the IDE controller worked and the PCI bus. And then the latest, the latest type of controller is called an AHCI. This is an Intel standard advanced host controller interface. AHCI mode is believed to be faster, but actually isn't faster than native the, the so-called native IDE or native PCI mode. Um, and BIOSes differ in, in the way they're configured. Most people just, you know, if they're building a new system from scratch, they will, they will uh, install the OS on their BIOS or, or on, their, they're on their motherboard and, and run it. Most BIOSes are still defaulting to this compatibility mode, this native PCI, which is compatible with IDE, rather than using AHCI. People believe AHCI is faster. Um, arguably, it's faster in a server setting because it, it, allows, it allows drives to be given many things to do at once and for the drive to schedule their completion and, and essentially whether it's reading or writing data to, to, to perform that as they are able to in order to, to improve the, the overall throughput through the drive. But that really requires that, that the system have many different sorts of things to do at once and typical single user workstations don't. You know, the system sits around most of the time waiting for something to do. So it really isn't clear that that's uh, a benefit. One of the requirements that SpinRight has imposed, SpinRight 6 has imposed on its users, is that if SpinRight doesn't see the drive because the motherboard has been set for AHCI mode, that, that the user who wants to run SpinRight manually change the BIOS over to this compatibility mode and then SpinRight will see it. You run SpinRight, it does its recovery job, and then you switch it back. The good news is all of that will be automatic because it turns out that all of the AHCI controllers also support the original compatibility mode, and SpinRight will be able, without you having to mess with the BIOS, to just make the switch for you. But the big problem is buffer size. The traditional track on a hard drive was 17 sectors. An MFM, a modified frequency modulation track, had 17 sectors. Then we went to RLL and we got 26 sectors. That was a 50% density improvement with run length limited encoding. We got 20, we got 26 sectors. But in the BIOS, the, the there is there are only five bits to specify the sector number. Well, Five bits gives you from zero to 63 in binary. And, and so that's, the tip, that, that's, that's technically 64 different possibilities, except that sector zero was never valid. There was never a sector zero. For some reason, we don't know why, there, there's, a, there's a head zero, there's a cylinder zero, but sectors were always numbered from one. So who knows why? So, so that means you could only have 63 sectors on a track. Well, that, that 63 sectors, if we round it up to make the math easy, that's 64. And sectors are 512 bytes each, which is to say half a K each. So that means that a track buffer was 32K. The problem is that SpinRight 6 today is, is working with, with 63 sector buffers. That is the, the short, slightly smaller than a 62K buffer. Um, and transferring chunks of the hard drive at at 
this buffer size um, back and forth as fast as it can. What we really need, though, are much larger buffers. And th this is where I hit a problem um, last week, essentially, as I was methodically moving forward, solving one problem after another in this, in this update of SpinWright's low-level data transfer architecture. I needed megabytes of buffers. In fact, you know me, I, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it all the way. All of the, all of the late model drives, and actually drives for that have followed the ATAPI standard or the ATA standard for many, many years, they support a transfer of up to 64K sectors. So, so that's 64K 512-byte sectors. You can, you can actually tell the drive... I want you to transfer that block. Well, that is 32 megs. That's and, and it turns out that's 32 binary megs, which is 33.55 actual million bytes of data in a single transfer. Well, now that's fabulous because what that means is that that the drive would start at whatever sector we tell it, and it would either write data or read data nonstop until it has transferred 32 megs of data in, in a, in a, in, from a single request. And the one thing that drives have gotten right, remember Spinrite was born to fix the interleave of drives in order to allow them to transfer as, as much data as possible per rev. That, was, have, that was what Spinrite was designed for originally? Not, yes. How interesting. Yes, um, I probably it was, used it that way. I remember changing the interleave of my old uh, Seagate. Um, oh, exactly the ST two fifty three. I think it was three. Yeah, two fifty five, maybe one. Um, I thought, but anyway, two fifty one. Yes, yeah, ST two fifty one. You're right. Yeah, it used. It was the first to not use. Uh, what's the successor to MFM? It used anyway. It, it, it was RLL. RLL. Right. That's right. It was the early RLL drive, yeah. and they were all interleaved wrong. Yeah. It's been, and so Spinrite was was I wrote it to be an interleave optimizer. That's so I bought it in version one. Yeah, and wow. and the the reason I had to add all this other technology is that sectors were marked bad in logical sectors. Right. But if I rearrange the interleave, oh, yeah. then it the, would be meaningless. the 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 error in the sector went to a different logical right. sector because it was in the same physical location. Right. So that meant I had to detect errors. I had to do pattern testing. I had to verify the surface. I had to do all this other stuff just to interleave, to, just to, re -inter to safely re-interleave the drive. How funny. How funny. And so, of course, we lost that. No, no one is doing messing with their interleave <laughs> no. anymore. They're all one-to-one. -one. Right. Yet, yet because... Spin oh, and the other thing is... If I was going to re... I, the, because the only way to change the interleave is to do a new low-level format. I had to re-low-level right. format one track at the new interleave. Right. Well, if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to wipe out all the data. That means I have to absolutely recover absolutely <laughs> everything. everything that is there. So so all of the, all of the stuff that we use SpinWrite for now is actually a side effect. Wow. Of the fact that I had to do, I was, as, as you know, my nature, it was going to be right. And the only way to do it right was to absolutely do data recovery and then surface analysis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to safely and properly re-interleave the drive. And I had those 251s. I upgraded my FidoNet BBS to those, M those RLL drives. And I remember we were trying to get the most, I was trying to get the most speed out of them. And I remember, I must, th I, that's where I met Steve uh, for the first well, time. <laughs> that's, and, that's great. And I did something in the in, in my InfoWorld column that was the most popular thing I, probably I ever did. I, it was called Steve's Dream Machine. And yes, one of the things, one, yes. one of the things I noted was that the drives we were all using actually had some unused cylinders at the end. And if you did something, I don't remember the details now, to like fudge the size of the drive, you could then get two maximum size <laughs> 32 megabyte partitions 
on the same drive. You could get a C and a D, and neither of them of them could possibly be any larger because of the of the sector count problem that we had in that version of DOS. And so everyone loved the idea that you could just sort of like push. You could get a of, you know just a few more. Um, cylinders out of the drive and then get two beautiful 32 meg, uh, you know, partitions, a, a C and a D. So, you know, that was all craziness that we were up to back then. But so, so here I am what, with drives in the world. All Everyone listening to this has drives that can transfer 32 megs at once. And of course, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to figure out how to make that happen. But the problem is, Spinrite is a real mode program. DOS, free DOS, MS DOS, all DOS is real mode. Real mode is what was originally, it, we, there, was, it, what, there was nothing called real mode in, in the beginning because there was no alternative mode. So they, no one called it real mode when it was the only mode you had, it was just the chip. You know, the 8088 and the 8086. You know, the 8088 was in the original IBM PC, and and it allowed you to access one megabyte of memory. And and remember, we had the Apple II at that time, and that was that allowed you, that had a 16-bit address bus, and 16 bits allows you to do 64K. So it, it allowed you to do 64K of memory. And so the, the, one of the big deals about the IBM PC was it had this next generation Intel processor. The, um, there was the 8080, and it was very much like the 6502 chip that was in the Apple II. Similarly, had a 64K memory size limitation. So for the 8088, Intel added four bits to the address bus. So the 8088 had a 20-bit, 16 plus 4, a 20-bit address bus, and that allowed it to access 16 times 64K of memory, which was a meg. And because that seemed like an insane amount of memory back then, we, they, they allocated, they, they just took up the, the upper third, 384K, was just sort of squatted on by the display memory and the BIOS was up, uh, up in the high memory area. And just, you know, and ROMs that, that, that came with uh, d different um, controllers that you might plug in and so forth. Everything lived, uh, all of that sort of the I.O. space for, for video and BIOS and things was in the upper 384K, the lower 640K was RAM available to software. And of course, oh, 640K, who's ever going to fill that up? So, so that was the 8088 with 20, with, with, with 20 bits of address space. And that is the, that is the world that Spinrite was born in. And it's the world that Spinrite still exists in. Um, it is, you know, you, when you boot free DOS, you're in, in so-called real mode. It wasn't until the next chip, the 8286, where, where Intel introduced something called protected mode. And it was, it was because they added protected mode that they said, okay, well, what are we going to call that other mode? You know, like what it's always been before. What the what no what the eighty eighty eight and the eighty eighty six and and so forth chips are and I said, well let's call that the real mode because you know that, that's all if, if for one thing no software understood protected mode when they came out with the PCAT that that was it was the PCAT that had a two eighty six chip in it and um, and they again added four bits so that had a um, a 24-bit address bus. So now you could get 16 megabytes of memory, although it was incredibly expensive and, and nobody did that initially. Um, so, so that's why they were calling that uh, the original mode, the so-called real mode. Okay, so, so here I am w today with Spinrite. Um, we are, when, the, when all of these processors boot up, they are in real mode. The BIOS 
is in real mode. Um, the DOS is still around, it turns out, um, because it's still being used as a loader for other operating systems. And so, so real mode has never gone away. It's still supported in the very latest chips because it's still the foundation of how these systems operate. So, so Spinrod operates in real mode and real mode knows that it has this memory concept that I was just describing for the original IBM PC of one megabyte. Now, that has never been a problem for Spinrite ever because the, the, the code itself, we often remark about how small it is. It's, you know, written by hand in assembly language. Um, it was less than 64K for several generations. It was a COM file, which is just an image that's, that gets loaded into memory. And then it, it had to outgrow that with Spinrite 3, I think it was. But it's, it's always been able to operate with relatively small buffers. For 6.1, I need to change that. If everyone's drives can transfer 32 megs at a time, that's what I want Spinrite 6.1 to be able to do. But I'm in real mode, and there's no way to access more than a megabyte in real mode. That, that's, that's always been the case. And, and protected mode is completely incompatible with real mode. It's, I mean, they're, they're, they're oil and water. Um, they're, they're, they're just, they, they just don't get along in any fashion. But of course, when, when IBM, I'm sorry, when Intel created the 8286, they realized, I mean, if, if, if Intel has ever been anything, it's backward compatible. And really, that's been the success story of all of these companies. Microsoft is backward compatible. They always arrange for their new operating systems to run the oldest code you've ever seen. Way, I mean, way, way back. Um, Intel is the, it has always adopted the same policy, and that is forward. You know, it is, as they move forward, they're going to retain backward compatibility. So the 8286 chip similarly booted, just as all of the chips today do, even 8386 and, and our Pentiums and our Core i7, everything, they all boot up in real mode. Intel then created the ability to switch into this so-called protected mode. And, and in protected mode, you, have, you, you finally had this notion of a supervisory process, sort of like you know, the operating system actually exists as an entity rather than just sharing memory along with the various programs that are running. And it's sort of as an executive and it's able to manage the programs that are running underneath it and the, the programs using the so-called protected mode. That This protection is them being protected from each other and protected from, from having like direct access to the system's hardware, which could allow the programs too much freedom and power. So, so the, the, the programs are constrained. So, so... The way back on the Intel 8088, it was a 16-bit processor. I mean, it, it, it was still a 16-bit machine. But remember, it had a 20-bit address bus. That is, it was a 16-bit machine that could access 20 bits worth of memory, one megabyte of memory. How is that possible? Well, what Intel did was they, they created the concept of segments. And that's, I mean, segment is a word that probably many people have heard before. That was an, an, an innovation where Intel said, okay, we've, we've, we have a 16-bit machine, but we somehow need to roam around within 20 bits. We need, we need to access more than 64K, which is all we can access with 16 bits. So they took a second register, the so-called segment register, and they shifted it over, they shifted it left four bits. And 
the value of that register would then be added to the to the 16-bit value that the instruction was able to offer in order to generate a total of a 20-bit address. And so that's the so-called segmentation concept that the Intel processors have, have always used. Um, back in the 8088, there was so, so the idea would be the segment register would sort of specify which 64K region within the megabyte of memory of the 8088 you were able to access. And, and that, that's what I programmed in, and Spinrite today still has a lot of that logic because it runs in real mode. When, when Intel went to the 286, they said, okay, um, we're going to change the way segmentation works. Rather than taking the value of the segment register and multiplying it by 16, which is what shifting it four bits to the left does, we're going to still have a 16-bit segment register, but it's going to refer to a table in memory, and the table in memory will specify the starting address of the segment, and it will specify the size of the segment. That is called the limit of the segment, and all those cool other properties that we want segments to have, like is it a code segment or a data segment? Can you execute in this or not? Is it readable? Is it writable? What is the privilege level? So by, by creating sort of this, this indirection table, Intel gave us protected mode. So the, the, the segment, the value in the segment register Back in, in real mode, it's just multiplied by 16 and then added to the, what's called the offset, the, other, the, 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 the original 16 bits. Instead, Intel said, okay, we're going to have that refer to a table that has much more exotic properties. It'll, it can be any offset in memory, so that, that'll be 32 bits, and, but, and the limit register, we're going to make that, we're going to keep that at 16 bits, but we'll have a granularity bit where, where the values either specify bytes or 4K chunks. Um, and I'm sorry, the, the limit register was 20 bits, um, where, and, and the base is 32 bits. And the granularity specifies either bytes or 4K chunks. And the, the beauty of that is 20 bytes, uh, 20 bits of the register in 4K chunks gives you four gigabytes, which is 32 bits. So that's that's where this notion of four gigs of address space came from and this 32-bit base address in this table. But now Intel had a problem with their design because back in the 8088, as instructions were being executed, and they were referring to segments and offsets. The, the hardware to do that was trivial. You would take whatever was in the segment register. You could shift it left by four. You could actually hardware can do that instantly. You just sort of wire the bits over four spaces. And then you add the offset into that segment to get the 20 bits. So, I mean, that's like instantaneous. That's no trouble at all. But with the design of protected mode in the 286, remember that the segments refer to tables in memory. So that would mean as you were executing instructions you, with, and, ref, and these instructions were referring to segments, the chip would have to be going out and fetching the entry in the table that the segment register referred to, getting all of that data, the base of the segment, that's 32 bits, the limit, and then it would have to, it would have to take the base, add that to the offset, then check it against the limit to see whether you were exceeding the bounds of the segment. So it was like, wait a minute, you know, this thing's gonna be slower than the 8088. Well, 
The answer from a computer science standpoint is pretty simple. You use a cache. And, and which is exactly what Intel did in the 286. The idea is that these segment registers, they're not changing all the time. They're loaded with a value when the code wants to work within that segment. And normally it sits in there in, within a given segment for a while, and it may be referring to data in several other segments, but it's roaming around within the segment. The segment itself is not changing. So the idea is anytime the segment register is loaded, only when it's loaded does a reference have to be made to this table in main memory to get all of the data that that segment register is referring to. And in fact, it's called a selector now. It's selecting a set of descriptors that are in this table. And the chip caches them. Essentially, it reads them once from the table into its hardware, into its internal hardware, so that then all references to memory in that segment can be instantly fixed up. They, they can be added, they can be limit checked, they can be checked for read and write and code and data and priority level and all those things that were added to, say, to create this segmented, this sort of this constrained and controlled architecture in the, as Intel was moving forward. So, so that's how the 286 operated. Now, there was a problem with the 286, and that is there was no way to take it out of protected mode back to real mode at all. There was, there was an instruction in real mode for switching to protected mode, but the engineers at Intel thought, hey, this is a better mode. Why would you ever want to go back? And it turns out everyone did because nothing ran in protected mode at the time. And so, and the BIOS was in real mode. DOS was still in real mode. Uh, when you plugged controller cards in, they brought their own BIOS. There was a video BIOS that controller cards had. There was a disk BIOS that disk controller cards, cards had. They were all set for real mode. So nothing ran in protected mode. So it was a, a catastrophe that you were unable to switch the 286 back into real mode. And so believe it or not, the IBM engineers who, who realized they had a problem, they said, well, only thing we can do is to reset the chip. And so they, they actually did that on the fly. The, the, what, you know, the original OS2 operating system that was the early operating system for the PCAT, whenever it needed to use the BIOS or do any I.O. with any of the peripherals, it would do this on-the-fly reset. It would literally reset the chip. The chip would come back up in real mode, as all Intel processors always do, and they, they, they would save the state of the chip just before the reset in some of the RAM of the clock controller. Oh, the clock, wow. The, the clock chip had some unused ramps. It was a hack. It was unbelievable hack. And so, so when the chip would come out of reset, it would go to the BIOS, and then it would check the data in the clock RAM to see if it looked reasonable. Did it, did it look, match the pattern of, oh, crap, I was just in protected mode, and now this is what I have to load my registers with, and, and this is where I have to go. And so it was, it was an incredible kludge. Um, when, when they did the 386, Intel fixed this. This was clearly a mistake. There was, I mean, it was, a, it, just a, it was bizarre that you could not switch the chip back to real mode. Everyone wanted to. So the 8386 does allow you, there, there's a bit in control register zero, it's the zero bit that you turn on and now you're in protected mode. And you turn it off, and now you're in real mode. It's just like, it's, I mean, it couldn't be any simpler. You know, I mean, they, they completely fixed it. 
But how did Microsoft, uh, sorry, Intel, how did Intel emulate real mode in their advanced processors? And this is the key. How did they emulate real mode? Real mode, as I said, has these, these segments that are limited to 64K. They're that, I mean, that's all you can address with 16 bits. And in, in real mode on a 386, on, a, you know, on, an, I, on an Intel Core i7, on, a, on any of these chips in our Macs and in our PCs, we've got 32-bit registers. You know, the, 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 the you have AL is the low 8 bits, AH is the high 8 bits, AX is them together making 16 bits, and so-called EAX is the extended AX, and that's 32 bits. We've got all the registers that are 32 bits, but in real mode, we only have the lower 16 valid. We, we are only able to access 64K no matter of, of in a segment, no matter how much memory the system may have. And so here I am looking at, at Spinrite in real mode and realizing that I need 32 meg buffers, yet I'm in real mode and I cannot have them. And I can't run in protected mode because DOS doesn't and Spinrite doesn't and nothing does. You know, it's except, you know, real, you know, protected mode operating systems, but that's not what I have. And I can't rewrite everything. That's, that'll be version seven. But still, the reason I want these 32K buffers is that disks have gotten so dense that if I'm only able to issue 60 or 30, uh, um, 63 sector transfers in 32K buffers, not megs, 32K, then I ask for the data and I and it's read. Then I ask for the next. But in the in the interval, I've lost the next sector. And so I have got to go all the way around again. It's like the drive is misinterleaved. I mean it works. Spin right today works. We're selling it. People are using it. It's doing data recovery, but it is not as fast as it could be. I don't know yet how much faster Spinrite will be with 32 megabyte buffers, but my guess is at least at least twice as fast because I am probably missing a revolution for every block of a uh, small block of sectors I ask mm, for. Yeah. I've got to go all the way around again and get the next block all the way around again and get the next block. So drives today are optimized for reading in a forward direction without ever missing a spin. So I would be able to read. So, so, we're, so we're talking about going from 32K to 32 megs. So I would be saving a thousand revolutions of the drive when I transfer 32 megs. And so it's worth doing. Well, the answer to this is what Intel did was they simulated real mode with their protected mode technology. They had all that fancy technology with base addresses and sector limits and so forth. So when the chip comes up out of reset, the microcode, the, the firmware in the chip, it loads those caches. Remember that in real mode, there are no caches. There's, there, there's no segment descriptor caching and all of that. That, that. that doesn't exist. All we've got is the simple math of multiplying the segment register by 16, that is shifting it over four, in order to give us a total of 20, to, uh, 20 bits of addressability. So the firmware behind the scenes, it loads the, these caches, the, the segment descriptor caches with 64K limits and and allows full read and write code or data, you know, no protection at all because there was, you could do anything you wanted to with the memory in an 8088 in, in a real mode processor. There's no, there's, you know, there, there, there are no constraints. And so, and, and so the only thing then that real mode is doing is multiplying the segment register by 16 and adding it. Behind the scenes, 
there is this the 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 limit registers and the privileges and things, but you never see them in real mode. Since the only way to take the 286 out of real mode was resetting it, real mode was always exactly like that. But remember that I said the 386, Intel realized they'd made a mistake Obviously, people needed to drop back to real mode all the time, so they made it as simple as resetting a bit to drop back to real mode. What Intel forgot was to change the cache for its segmentation when they do that. It turns out that when you drop the 386 or any subsequent processor ever made back to real mode, and they can all do that. Although the firmware in the chip, when it boots, when the chip first comes up out of reset, the firmware loads those caches with real mode segments. When, you, when you're up and running in protected mode, and you've, you've been loading descriptors from RAM and loading the caches and so forth, when you turn that bit off, the only thing that Intel does is they go back to multiplying the segment register by, by, by 16. They never again touch those descriptor caches. So what that means is it is possible... And I did it yesterday, which is why I'm so excited about this. It is possible to switch into protected mode and to put into memory four gig, a four gig limit. That is all Fs, five Fs for 20 bits worth of F in the limit register. The granularity is set to 4K, so that stretches all the way to four gigs. Um, set all the privileges to free, read, write, code, data, anything you want to do, fully privileged. Then you load each of the segment registers. There's a code segment, data segment, extra segment, stack segment, and then there's an F segment and a G segment. You load them all with that descriptor, which completely sets them for four gigs of access then you simply drop back out of protected mode to real mode. Now you are back in real mode. Everything works. DOS works. The BIOS works. SpinWrite runs. Everybody's happy. Yet there is no limit any longer on the size of the segments. If you, since we've got 32-bit registers in all of our 386 and, and subsequent processors... You can then put full 32-bit addresses into those registers and they directly access physical memory. So what this means is that that when that spinwright 61 will oh and this is this is not something I just discovered. This is well understood, well known. It's been known for actually we're not sure how long it's been known for. IBM got a patent on this that they issued the patent in 1994. They called it an artifact of Intel's protected mode. They got, they, they, in 94, they submitted the patent. It was granted in 97. So that's 60, it was 97, August 24th of 1997, two days ago and 16 years. Meaning that since patents have a 17-year life, it's got one year left mm. of the patent. Except that people were using this in the early 90s. Wikipedia says that game developers who needed, you know, more space, they were, this is sometimes called unreal mode. There's real mode, and this is called unreal mode. 
or sometimes called huge real mode, big real mode, because there was never officially named, it's known by all kinds of things. I call it extended real mode because it gives me access to what has always been considered extended memory in the original real mode context. Um, and, and so it looks like there was active use of this predating IBM's filing and grant being granted a patent. So the patent is probably not valid. Everybody uses it. DPMI, the, the DOS protected mode um, interface managers use it. HiMem.sys, you know, EMM386.sys. Everybody ha has taken advantage of this. So, you know, it's probable that there's plenty of prior art here. Um, what I wanted, though, was not to use any of those memory managers because they don't operate the way I need them to. They copy blocks for you down from extended memory down into um, conventional memory or back up. So they sort of shuffle things back and forth. You never really get access to it. I needed Spinrite to have full direct access to the entire physical memory up to four gigabytes. I'll, I'll now then... Um, with 6.1, have 32 meg buffers and be able to transfer massive blocks of data at a time. And since I've got 32-bit registers, Spinrite will simply be able to reach right up out there into the stratosphere and, and do whatever it needs to with the user data because of this weird little fluke in the Intel design. Oh, and by the way, they can never change it because everybody uses it. It's one of those uh, things where uh, it may have been an oversight because when you come up for the first time, you have, you're have you absolutely restricted to 64K. It's only when you go into protected mode, change the shadow cache, as it's called, the shadow descriptor cache, and then drop out that you you like, oh, look, I can now access all of memory, and I'm in real mode. So it's the best of both worlds. Cool. Yeah. Does this change how you do anything? Well, it, um, I mean, it, the, the, all of the PCI utilities, all of the, 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 the disk controllers, they have access to this full memory. So, so Spinrite will operate with the disk controllers, set them up, and, and, and instruct them to transfer 32 megs of memory at a time. I will probably use several of these buffers. So, for example, while one is being transferred, Spinrite is working with the other. For example, it does this, the, 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 um, the, the bit inversion, where it inverts all the bits and then writes it and then reads it back and verifies it and then inverts them again and writes it and reads it back and verifies it. I can use essentially a double buffering scheme so that, Trans there's data being transferred in one buffer while I'm busy uh, in inverting and verifying the other buffer and so forth. So, yeah, there's lots of games that I can play having access essentially to the entire system's memory um, from within real mode. Steve Gibson, it's, a, it's an education to listen to <laughs> you. And a trip down memory lane, I must say. Yep. What fun. Somebody said you should write a textbook. I, I don't know if there's a lot of use for this particular information anymore, but it's fascinating. I guess it's somewhat yeah. useful. Well, it's funny, too, because... If you're writing low-level uh, disk drivers. Even, even Intel's contemporary documentation, does they get this wrong. They, really? they say, yes, they say as, as long as you don't change the segment register the cache will not be invalidated. Mm. It turns out that's wrong. And I went looking through all kinds of source code, uh, like I was, I was looking at the FreeDOS source code, and no one quite understands it the way I've just explained it. I've explained it in, a, in exactly the way I have watched it operate and verified it. So, I mean, it's, there, there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion about exactly why this happened and, and how it works. Um, as far as I know, what I've just explained uh, is the is the whole story. Hey, an update on the uh, Snowden uh, case. I'm reading uh, oh. the New York Times blogs. It's not what you think. When uh. Uh, people came to Edward's uh, house, particularly lawyers uh, advising him, um, he would have them put their cell phones in the fridge to block eavesdropping. <laughs> 
apparently that's uh, pretty clever though <laughs> it's very smart yeah. it's got See, metal walls guy, right guy is not stupid yeah <laughs> Um, it block. So just a tip for anybody who wants to, you know, make your cell phone, uh, have a little privacy. It's, it's, it's a, it, it, it's a kitchen based Faraday cage. Yeah. Yeah. You might want to put it in a plastic bag to keep from the getting <laughs> wet condensation, but uh, and be careful when you take it out. Wow. <laughs> it's interesting too, because you could tell people to turn it off. But, you know, do they really? Right. But, you know, when you tell them, okay, so we're going to stick gonna it in, in here fridge. with the, we're going to put it with the lettuce and the onions. Yeah. That's uh, pretty clear. A stainless steel martini shaker is the other. <laughs> it's a perfect Faraday cage, according to this article on the New in the New York Times. So everybody get a stainless steel uh martini uh, shaker. and yeah, That would, that actually would be pretty good. I've, I've yeah. always. I've marveled the fact that that metal on metal somehow doesn't leak. Every time I yeah. see the bartender shaking this, I'm thinking, how is that not I leaking? I know. But it should. You need a grommet. <laughs> think, yeah. An exactly. O-ring of something. I want a, I want a grommet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, just love it. <laughs> Steve, you are amazing. Uh, what, a, what a fun show this was. I hope everybody got a kick out of it and uh, maybe even learned some useful information. In for information about Intel history. Uh, Steve is at grc.com. That's where you'll find 16 kilobit audio for those of you with uh, bandwidth limitations. Also transcriptions. Getting more expensive by the minute, literally. <laughs> uh, you uh, can get all of Steve's freebies and you can get the latest spin right with a guaranteed upgrade to the next version. grc.com. Next week it's a Q&A episode. That means you should go there and ask any questions you have. Uh, yes. GRC.com slash feedback is the place to post your questions. And Steve will pick 10 for next week. And I uh, think since people are kind of, they're all asking me about perfect forward security mm. and SSL. There's been, a, there's been a concern about whether the NSA is capturing traffic now for later decryption and whether cap, getting someone's private SSL keys at any time in the future would allow them to de would allow the NSA oh. to decrypt all of the capture oh. communications in the past. So in two weeks, our topic will be perfect forward secrecy and <laughs> SSL. Excellent, as always, you the man. Uh, if you want to watch this live, you can. 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC on uh, Wednesdays at twit.tv. But we do make on demand. Audio and video, high quality audio and video available on our site, twit.tv slash S N. And uh, best thing to do, subscribe. That way you'll always have Security Now for your listening pleasure. Steve, we'll see you next time on Security Now. Thanks, Leo. Security Now.